But in Joel chapter 3, verse 10, God says this to Israel in an incredibly critical time in their lives. Nothing has gone right. Nothing has gone well. Nothing has gone according to plan. Their world is in radical devastation. They're constantly under oppression. Their children are being sold into slavery. They're, they haven't experienced freedom in so long they can barely remember what it tastes like. And God says to them, because they've, they've basically acquiesced. They've stopped fighting. They stopped believing that their lives could be different. They stopped believing that they could be different. And I think they stopped believing that God would do something. And in verse 10 he says, Make your plows into swords. Make spears from your hooks for trimming trees. But then he says this, let the weak say, I am strong. There it is. Let the weak say, I am strong. Now, if you're the weak, what you are not by definition is strong. So if you are the weak and God is saying to you, let the weak say you are strong, he's saying, you need to lie to yourself. You need to tell yourself something that isn't true about yourself. And I know we're not supposed to have conversations like this, but this is, this is the way I read the Bible. I let it tell me what it says and disturb me. God, why would you have me say, because I apply it to myself, something that isn't true about myself? God, why would you have me lie to myself? It's like me looking at the stranger and saying, I know you're here ready to learn. I don't know. I don't know if you're here because your boss paid for you to be here. I don't know if you're here because you'd rather be here than at work. I don't know why you're here. It's a business conference. There are a lot of motivations around it. But why then would God be okay by telling the weak that they should tell themselves, I am strong? There's something God understands about identity that I think sometimes we miss. Because in this particular moment, what God is actually trying to tell them is that you must shape your identity not on who you are or who you've been, but who I'm going to make you become. Let the weak say, I am strong. This is a shift. And and I I want to thank you for that earlier announcement for MindShift, but I want you to understand that I'm not just... Writing a book because, oh, I like to write books. I I find everywhere I go, people who have limited their own capacity, their own potential, who are living a minimal life, who are barely surviving and existing because they've created such internal limitations that they're suffocating themselves to death. And the reality is that they're right about themselves. They are the weak. Because when I feel weak, I'm right about myself. Do you ever feel it? I do. Those moments I feel inadequate. I'm, I actually know myself better than someone else. And in fact, that's why sometimes someone else's encouragement doesn't help me. Go, no, Erwin, you can do it. You don't know me. <laughs> I can't. You are overestimating me. No, Erwin, you got this. You don't know. If I, I don't got this, I don't even got it. You ever just feel like you're just faking it and lying to everyone else and one day you're going to get found out? One day they're going to realize you're you're not as smart as they think and you're not as talented as they think and you're not as good as they think and you're not what they think and and you spend so much energy trying to become what everyone else thinks you are but you know you're so much less. You're just the weak. And then you have God saying to you, In that moment when you know you're the weak, that's when I need you to tell yourself, I am strong. This is when I need you to reach to a different source for your identity. What I found is that your identity is your destiny. As I listen to conversations about Achieving your potential and, you know, going for your destiny and living out your calling, whatever the language is, that in the end, the actual 
scale of your personal capacity is directly connected to the depth of your identity, of who you say you are. And, and this is why, for me, hearing God speak into my life is so critical. Because I, I'm in a conflict, and, and I have always thought my conflict was, I think I'm more than I am, and God knows I'm less than I am. Isn't that the way oftentimes we think about God? I mean, God's so big, and he knows everything, and he knows you're not. But it's actually the opposite that's true. See, it, it's it, 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 this, this relationship with God, this, this spiritual engagement that happens at the depth of our soul. It's not us in the end telling God how awesome we are and God telling us, no, you're not awesome. You're less. It's actually in our most authentic and honest moments, in our most fragile and vulnerable moments, coming to God and saying, God, I don't have what it takes. God, I'm not that. God, I can lie to everyone else. I, I, can, I can con everyone else, but I know that you see me. You say, God, I am weak. This is when you need to, to let the silence overwhelm you until you hear God speak into your life. I need you to eradicate that declaration of yourself out of your mouth. Because what you say about yourself matters. And if you spend your entire life saying, I am weak, then you will never step into the identity that Jesus died for you to step into. And God wants you to be able to stand and go, no, I am strong. God is saying, don't let the person who thinks they're weak say they're strong. Let the weak say they're strong. You need to step into the identity God has given you before you can step into the life God has for you. You see this over and over again in the scriptures. I'm just going to take you just to a few. What God is doing. God is shifting our identity from who we are to who we are becoming. Which makes so much sense because God is outside of time. Why would God ever define you based on your past? Why would God even define you based on your present? God isn't even going to define you based on your near future. God is going to define you from your absolute future. See, God sees a you that you can't even imagine. God sees the you beyond time and space. God sees the you beyond your last breath on earth, and God is impressed because he recreated you. So in Genesis 17, verse 5, God has a meeting with a guy named Abram. We don't usually call him Abram. But in verse 5, it says, I am changing your name. This is God talking to Abram. I am changing your name from Abram to Abraham. So I'm, I'm changing your name. This is because I am making you a father to many nations, which is what Abraham means. Now, what's amazing to me is that Abram did not have any children and Abraham did not have any children. <laughs> Can you imagine being this old guy who now changes his name? Because I don't know if other people think God changed his name. I think people thought Abram's out of his mind. He's <laughs> lost it. I know that's what Sarah thought because she laughed. Now he's calling himself, I am the father of many nations. Every time he says his name, who are you? Abraham. I am the father of many nations. Like, you ain't even the father of one nation. Like, you're not of a, of a, of a county, uh, you know, of a village. You're, you, you can't even father a small hut. What, what are you talking about? And God actually forces him by taking on a new name to declare his new identity every single day of his life long before it actually became a reality. In fact, the reality of it didn't happen until after his death. 